But coming up next, we're going to have Dr. Kenny Bird on, our UK livestock economist. He's going to give us a little bit, uh, some tips and considerations for some cow-calf producers uh, here in Kentucky. So, Dr. Burdine, are you ready? I'm ready, Adam. Let's do it. Thanks. Thanks for the invite, as always. Good to, good to be on the program and talk some about cattle markets and going to focus more on management considerations. Califax is largely going to do the market component tonight, but um, I want to talk a little bit about just our markets and some signals and some of those signals and implications on the management side. And then I'm going to share a few thoughts that I've got, um, and, and they're going to be a little bit random, but just on some herd management considerations, cow culling, some things that I've kind of been working on. And then if I've got a couple of minutes, I want to just real quickly talk about um, LRP and both CFAP, our two, the, the two acronyms I've been discussing the most here in the last, last month or so. So start talking about just kind of basic markets and signals. Um, I'm, I'm going to focus on cow-calf as kind of the, the, topic here that we decided to go on, but in terms of those heavy feeders, you know, that they've pulled back, the board's pulled back about 10 bucks since August. And, you know, today was not a good day on the board. So if you, if you count today, we're down more like 13, 14, something like that. But we've not seen near as, near as big a pullback locally. Um, in fact, you know, we're only down, I think, a few bucks really the last few weeks. So our basis has actually improved while the, while the, the, uh, the future markets come down some. Patrick talked about, you know, the rising grain price, and that's been part of this. And then the other thing I was going on with heavy feeders, you know, this is kind of the transition time when we move from those heavy feeders being placed on an April live kettle board versus the June live kettle board. And we're getting about a six to $7 drop between April and June on the live kettle board. So this is always when our heavy feeders kind of become real vulnerable as it starts looking like those that are going to come off feed sometime in the summer, as opposed to the spring when prices are, are higher. I'm going to talk cull cows just a second. Cull cows were one of the bright spots we had here in the state for a good chunk of the year. Um, but you know, you just you just almost can't fight the seasonal trend here. We move more of our cull cows in the fall. If you look at the last couple of weeks, um, beef cow slaughter has been up quite a bit, actually. You know, well above where it was last year for this past. Uh, where we're well above where it was in 2019 for this past week, and that's just a current you can't quite fight. And as you move into winter, it's it's just hard to maintain cull cow prices. So. We may, we may well see our average dress boning cows drop down below 50 bucks before it's all sitting down here, but by year end, we're, we're in kind of the low 50s right now, but still a lot of cull cows in the upper 50s and 60s if they're in that higher dress range. I wanna talk about calves a bit more. Um, the Kentucky, Kentucky market, I said this is the flattest market I've ever seen because COVID took our spring run up out. And until the October, prices, which I've only got three weeks in October right now, but until those three weeks in October, we've been between $1.40 and $1.50 on the state average basis for a five-weight steer every single month this year. As I try to look at what we're seeing in the state, um, we had a couple fairly sizable weeks in August. We had a pretty sizable week in terms of runs at the end of September, but I still think we've got some calves to work through out there. And um, I think they're going to be coming. Our, our, our fall run, I think, is still largely ahead of us. So I, I do think there's some vulnerability on these calf prices still the next few months. I thought we'd hold prices above where they were in 2019. Um, I think it's going to be awfully close now that I kind of see where we are now and more calves coming down the road. Um, I, I don't know that wheat grazing conditions are going to help us a whole lot in the next month or two, which oftentimes is, is a, key, a key underpinning for our fall calf market. Um, I want to mention something else I don't talk about a lot, but, you know, we almost always talk about, you know, fall calf prices dropping and that's, you know, that's their seasonal tendency, which makes perfect sense. But I always pull up every Friday about nine o'clock, the state market report for the week. And this, a statement like this shows up quite a bit, but, but this is the, what I'm showing you right now is the one, the one that came out on Friday. So this is, this is for last week. It actually goes through Thursday. Like it kind of runs Friday through Thursday sales. But, you know, we've got a great set of market reporters. And as I was scrolling through the list of who was on, I saw, I saw some current ones and I saw some that have retired. But, you know, I, I, think, you, I think you just simply cannot undervalue what those folks do. And this is a statement directly that they had in the, the summary from Friday. And it said demand was mostly moderate for feeder cattle with the best demand shown for long wean 45 day preconditioned cattle. And we want to talk about how that, you know, this time of year when we've got warmer days and cooler nights and then the upcoming changing temperatures that, you know, health concerns become more paramount. 
around and that gives more premium to some of these wean type cattle. And that's spot on, that, that's very typical of fall. So, you know, one thing that I don't think I talk about enough is that yeah, our fall calf market does tend to drop, like it's just what it does seasonally. But the green, meaning the fresh off the cow calves get hit harder than the wean calves. And, and so that, you know, that separation gets to be a little bit wider this time of year and we're seeing that now. So, for example, if I look at those, those light five weight steers, you know, you've got about an $8 hundred weight difference in what those value added, those wean calves are selling for versus what those nondescript calves are selling for. Here's the same thing for the, you know, the, the heavy five. So, you know, kind of in that 550 to 550 to 600 pound range. We've got again about a seven, eight dollar difference. This is almost so wide it almost looks strange, but if you look at the, the light sixes, kind of that six to 650 range, you're talking more like 13 to 14 bucks an hundred weight. So a lot of separation between green calves and wean calves. So cow calf operators certainly, you know, push the pencil. You know, does it make sense to wean these calves to keep a bit longer? You know, there's some market incentive to do so. Again, efficiently during that time, there's typically money there to be had. I don't think I've ever shared this at Beef Conference. If I did, it would have been about three years ago and I've updated it. Um, but, you know, one of the questions I get on occasion will be somebody that'll call me about half mad because that, you know, for whatever reason, bulls are out selling steers in some market. And what usually happens is, you know, that they've sold, they've sold some steers and, and sometime while they were there, a group of bulls has sold for a, a higher price. We all know that's not the norm, um, but you know one thing I, I did, uh, and, and I do every every year. In fact, I go back and I pull, I pull my 550 pound steers, 550 pound bulls on a monthly basis, and I just simply compare the two. So at the same weight range, you know what's a bull price compared to a steer price, both in that medium and large frame number one two category. In the last the last um, ten years, so going back to 2010 to the end of 2019. So my last full, my last full 10 years, that steer calf sold, sold that bull calf by $11.20 a hundred weight. So at the same weight, we're talking about 61, 62 bucks a head. Someone always asked me, rightfully so, it's a good question. You know, well, what about weight gain on the bull versus the steer? So there, there's two ways I can answer that. The first thing I like to do is say, okay, well, how much more would that bull have to really outweigh that steer by to offset that price differential? And if I account for price slide, you know, not sale price, but what I actually additional pounds are worth when I account for the fact that heavier calves sell for less, 80 cents to a dollar is a pretty good range. So in a, in a pretty high value of gain market where additional pounds are worth a dollar a pound, that bull has got to outweigh that steer by 62 pounds to offset that many if that steer that steer weighs 550, that bull's got to weigh 612 to actually get you the same revenue per head. And at 80 cents, and we're kind of between these two right now, that bull's got to outweigh that steer by 77 pounds. So that's a pretty tall task. And I always like to mention this too, while I'm not an animal scientist, I've got some good friends that are, and um, you know, you know I've, I've heard them say this, that you know, implants will get you, you know, that, that bull type steer gain or this bull type gain on the steer. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. Unless you're in a market that does not allow that and you're being paid and rewarded for that, then implants are certainly an option that you can use to increase your weight gain and still get that steer price, which is better. I don't think I've ever showed this at beef conference, but you know, I, we've talked a lot, we talk a lot about you know steers versus bulls and steers versus heifers, and, and to some extent even small frame cattle, but I don't think I really talk much about the lighter muscle cattle. Um, the way that this gets broken up when it's reported to me um, is medium and large frame ones and twos medium and large frame twos and threes. So it's not broken on the exact uh, muscling score, but, but kind of that one, two range, two, three range. So bottom line is black lines, one, twos, blue lines, two, threes. The only point here is just these lighter muscles, these lighter muscle steers at the same weight. $19 a hundred weight discount going back to 2013. And this is just a shorter data set than the others why I can only go back to 13, but that's a pretty significant thing. So, you know, another thing I was kind of talking about is, you know, in addition to thinking about frame size and thinking about what you're moving, you know, this, this muscle makes a big difference. And I think a lot of times we look at those ones and twos and that becomes a market, but there are quite a few calves that, that do kind of move in that lighter muscling range. And there's a pretty significant discount to doing that. And I'm going to kind of wrap this piece up just kind of by saying, you know, whether we're talking about preconditioning and selling, you know, wing calves versus green calves, if we're talking about selling steers versus bulls, if we're talking about muscling, you know, be aware of what you're selling. 
and particularly when you start thinking about preconditioned calves and start thinking about bulls, you know, understand there are people who people whose role in this system is to buy calves that need some attention and add value to them. That's what they do. So if you're a cow calf operator and you want to think about, can I do some of those things myself to add some value? Because frankly, somebody's probably going to do that and they're going to resell those cattle heavier and they're upgrade them and make some money doing that. So, so do keep that in the back of your mind. Those are opportunities. I want to now share a few thoughts on kind of herd management considerations. And like I said, there's going to be about three topics here. I'm going to hit fairly quickly, but they're things that I've kind of been thinking about a lot and working on some with some colleagues. Um, I've talked about weaning rate a lot. I think three or four years ago, I talked about this at beef conference in a little more detail than I am tonight, but, you know, very simple. It's what, you know, what percent of my cows that I expose to a bull wean me a calf every year. And I always say that may be the single most important measure that I've got for a cow-calf operation. If I know the percent of your cows that you expose to a bull that wean you a calf every year, I know an awful lot about your revenue and your management. Good operations are going to be up in the 90s. You know, I, I see a lot of them up there in the low to mid 90s. Um, but folks, we've also got some out there that are in the 70s and maybe some even worse than that. But major impact on revenues and cost coverage, what it really does, it converts revenue per calf into revenue per cow. And that really is the story. You know, cow calf operations are tricky in the sense that, you know, our expenses tend to be imported all year long, our revenues tend to come in in big chunks. So it becomes really important that we can track and kind of separate those things to make sure that we know how much, how much profit we're actually turning on our operations. Simple, roughly an economist math here. I'm gonna use kind of the price roughly between what, you know, what a spring calving herd and a fall calving herd might, you know, might've done this year. But if I think about a cow calf operation that weans 550 pounds steer, steer or, hey, sorry, that weans 550 pound calves, think steer half or average at about a dollar 40 steer half or average price. That's a revenue per calf of 770 bucks. But when I incorporate weaning rate, you know, for example, at 90%, and which is a good weaning rate, by the way, if, you know, if I'm weaning nine calves or 10 cows I exposed to a bull, that 770 is 693. And on the other extreme here, if I'm weaning 75% calf crops, and I, I promise you there's some folks out there doing that, that 770 is really more like 578. So this difference is really what I'm talking about when I think about revenue per cow, it makes a huge difference in cost coverage and profitability. I'm convinced that if I'm not weaning at least 85% calf crops, that year in, year out, I'm not going to be profitable as a cow-calf operator. And I think all of our goals need to be to be north, north of 90% and to be profitable long term. So in terms of open cows, you know, there's always been the conventional notion that we just don't, don't retain open cows. And, and I don't advocate it either. Um, I have, I have heard some decent cases to be made for some young cows I mean, that didn't breed back their second year or something like that. Worked on a project early in my career um, that looked at this very question. And there, there may be cases when replacement animals are high um, that, that you may want to keep, you know, maybe a calf that didn't breed back for that second, a cow that didn't breed back that second time. But those, those are pretty scarce in my opinion. I do have some folks that like to roll, roll an open cow from a spring to a fall herd, and I'm fine. I understand why that makes sense. But, you know, th this really is a timing thing that's important, you know, that you need to understand that if someone's going to roll a herd, if I roll a cow from a spring calving cow to a fall calving cow because she was open, that means he or she caught her being open early, right? You know, if, if I just, if, if, if she just didn't calve when I expected her to, and all her herd mates had already calved, and then, then I caught it way too late for this to be an issue. So that'd be catching that early, but, but, but I can live with that one because ultimately you're gonna have a lot of those cows already. So giving her one more chance, if I go six months, makes more sense than going 12 months. But the message here is that these open cows are a huge profit drain, and you wanna minimize that to the extent possible. And you know, one of the things that I've you know, been able to do that I really enjoy is talk to some really good cow-calf operations over the years. And a lot of them tell me, you know, we, yeah, we've had this problem in the past and we, we call hard that way. You know, we, we call cows that don't have, and, um, and we, you know, we don't keep effort that way. And, and over time, you know, you'll, you'll build a better herd by making some tough decisions early on. So I guess the follow up question there is getting bred and calving enough. And um, I think we all know the answer is no, but I want to try and quantify that just a little bit based on some work that I've been doing. So, one of the reasons why I like a defined calving season is because it's easier to manage. 
and, and I don't mean that in the sense of what you do um, with the cattle. I mean it more in terms of tracking where the cow herd is. <laughs> it's difficult to manage a moving target. And if you're calving year round, you are managing a moving target. One thing I tell people that calve year round is distinguish between cows that calve every year and calve every 12 months and there is a difference. So start by managing calving interval. Track your birth dates and really notice when exactly these cows are calving. One that calved in January in 18, March in 19, and July in 2020, that's not the same thing as calving every 12 months. You know, simple math, if you've got a 15 month calving interval on a given cow, that's the same thing mathematically as her giving you four calves in five years, which is an 80% weaning rate. So just understand how much that matters. If you're a year round calver, by all means, manage calving interval and look for folks that looks for cows that calve every 12 months. Now, in terms of late cow or late calvers, and I became interested in this about, about a year and a half ago and then working on some. You know, the, the conventional wisdom has always been that you know, one of the biggest cost of late calvers is they calve late, which means when I wean, those calves are lighter. Absolutely. We also know though, due to anesterous, it's difficult to back cows up very much. You know, maybe a cycle, maybe two at the most, but you know, generally speaking, if a cow calves late in 2020, she's probably gonna be on the back end of calving in 2021 as well. So it becomes kind of a perpetual problem. In terms of valuing those pounds, you know, just you know, rough in economist math again, each cycle that I miss is 21 days. Rule of thumb, you know, calves gain about two pounds a day or something like that. I'm giving up something like 40 pounds for every cycle that I miss. In other words, if I, if I catch her second cycle, so the first, that calf's probably gonna be about 40 pounds lighter. In most markets, that's worth between 30 and $40 in revenue to that cow. But it's bigger than that. And it's this second piece that I became interested in about a year and a half ago, I've been working on some. Talking to some of my contacts in the marketing business, you know, they tell me that they really like to keep their calf weight ranges in the 50 to 75 pound range, meaning, if you unload your, you know, your calves in the fall or in the spring, and they go to sorting your steers and have them and putting them into, you know, groups that can sell together, they're looking for a 50 to 75 pound spread at most. That's what they're looking for. The other point that they made that I honestly hadn't thought about was that this is a bigger issue for smaller herds than larger herds. And the point being, if I've got, if I've got eight calves in a group, you know, a 50 to 75 pound spread is much, much more obvious than if I've got 30 or 40 in a group. So this is one thing that actually impacts you know, your smaller operations more so than larger operations. I wear this chart out, but this is really where I'm going. There is so much difference in price between, you know, a group of five or 10 calves and a single. And without getting the gory details here, what this really means, just understand that Obviously, the further I move, you know, upward and to the right here, the higher my price is. Here's roughly a truckload lot. But again, the real story is down here. You know, this is a group of five. On average, everything else held constant. A group of five outsells a single by 11 bucks a hundredweight. Here's a group of 10. Holding everything else constant, a group of 10 outsells a single by about 15 bucks a hundredweight. So those late calving cows, I've got fewer of them. They wean me lighter calves. Those lighter calves are not going to sell, are not going to sell in the same group as the earlier born calves. I'm going to have more smaller groups. So in my opinion, the other piece of this, in addition to those calves being lighter, they're going to sell in smaller groups. And you can take a pretty big hit when you've got those calves selling as singles, twos, and threes, when others are selling in groups of 10 and 15. So in my opinion, when I start accounting for not just the loss in winning weight, but also account for the fact. I'm gonna sell more of those calves in smaller groups. Those cows that I don't catch until maybe their fourth cycle. And again, I'm, you know, we're, we're talking at this point, you know, 60, 65 days, not, you know, not an incredibly long window. You know, you can be given up, I think, as much as $150 per calf when I combine both the winning weight loss and the fact that those are gonna sell in a whole lot smaller groups because there's gonna be fewer of them. So again, you know, we always talk about the, the three O's, open, old and honorary cows need to go, but I think these late calving cows are one to kind of target as something to really kind of say, do I really want to keep this gal? She, she may win a good calf, but she wins, you know, she wins late, she, she calves late every year, and I've got a small calf at weaning time that sells by itself. So she's a target, I think, is potential. 
cold. And then the last management topic I want to mention briefly that I've worked on some and did more of this about two years ago than the past year, but just talk about cow size. And, you know, there's been a lot, there's been a lot of, a lot of work on this. And I heard, heard a woman do an outstanding job talking about this at the um, symposium done by uh, Alltech a few years ago. And she did a meta, she showed a meta analysis, which basically means she looked at different studies that had looked at the correlation between mature cow weight and weaning weight. And what she found, and or what the studies found, was that there's no question that larger cows do tend to wean larger calves, but they don't necessarily wean proportionally larger calves, and and that becomes problematic when we think about cost. So we all know costs are going to increase as cow size increases. We know that. The only question is how much. And there's another problem here that becomes inherent. And and just follow my logic just a second. So it's difficult to track cost on a cow-calf operation, but even if I do a really good job doing that, understand that what I really can do is I can track what my average cost is per cow. You know, I might know how much I spend maintaining my cow herd, and yeah, I can divide that number of cows that I've got. That's only what my average cow maintenance cost is, okay? Not individual cow maintenance. If, it's the, if I'm using that average cow cost number, and at the same time, I'm tracking individual weaning weights, which we all should be, right? There's a danger in me using individual weaning weights, right? And at the same time, using average cow cost. Another way to say this is if I use weaning weights exclusively and I start culling cows that wean me smaller calves, it's very likely that I'm culling some of my smaller cows, which means over time, I'm driving the average weight of my cow herd up, which means I'm also driving up my average cost number. So... The point of this really is just that we need to be thinking about cow size as it relates to winning weight to the extent possible. Simple list here of just cost. Winter feed, pasture, vet medicine, breeding, mineral, trucking, marketing, breed stock depreciation, all important cost. Understand that the vast majority of those are going to be impacted somewhat by cow size. I'm going to go up as my cow size gets larger. So I'm going to give you the two-minute synopsis here of what we found using our, what we found in the study that we did. We took our basic cow-calf budget, okay, and kind of set it at, you know, think like a 1,200-pound cow or something. And then we just replicated the same budget for different cow sizes, making some assumptions, okay? And the assumptions that we made were as follows. We assumed that feed cost, pasture cost, and mineral cost were 100% proportional. By that, what I mean is a, a 10% larger cow consumes 10% more feed, pasture, and mineral. That's what we assumed, okay? Rough and kind of math, sure, but they're probably not too far off reality. Bet medicine, transportation, and other costs, we assumed were half proportional. Another way to say that is a 10% larger cow, we assumed we spent 5% more on bet medicine and transportation. So it doesn't take me longer to, to work a bigger cow, right? It shouldn't, maybe. But it, but it probably does take a little bit more in terms of vaccine, more and more things like that. We assume breeding was not affected. I get this question sometimes too, Kenny, one reason why I like big cows are they, they, they're big cull cows when I sell them and that's true. But if you go back and look at what you had developing those heifers, you know, years ago, you spent more money developing them too because they're bigger. So also think about the fact that that cull cow value comes six, eight, 10 years later. So that to me is a wash at best, but we did try to adjust both cull cow value and bread heifer value coming in to try to account for that. But take home message, you know, the old, there was always been an old adage out there that a cow should wean about half her body weight um, in calf. And that's not at the margin that works pretty well. What we found was for every additional hundred pounds of mature cow size I'm managing I need to be weaning at least about 50 more pounds of wean calf. So that's why that, you know, that, that holds pretty well at the margin. So think about that, you know, a, you know, a 1400 pound cow should be weaning you about a hundred pounds more than a 1200 pound cow. So it's hard to think about this in terms of actual, um, actual cost and think about it more conceptually. So like when you, when you, when you sell a cold cow, it's kind of use that to kind of calibrate your mind. And then think about your cow sizes, and you just want to kind of think about your weaning weight in relation to their cow size as much as possible. Two last things here quickly, and we're doing pretty good on time. Um, I'm going to do some programming on livestock risk protection insurance again over the winter. I'll, I'll probably do a video here sometime first of the year at, at the latest, maybe even as, as early as November, December. 
But if you looked at LRP in the past and passed on it, understand it's more attractive now than it was then. Without getting into a lot of details, it works very much like a put option. You're basically buying a price index insurance policy that will pay you if the CME feeder cattle index is below a threshold you choose on the ending date of the policy. So if I've got cattle that I'm planning to sell in the spring, I could buy an LRP policy with an ending date in the spring at a certain level. And then if the L if CME index is below that level come spring, I can get dollar for dollar compensation for what the index is and what my threshold was. So be aware of it. The reason I like LRP and, and I talk about futures and options a lot, and I, I do like futures and options, but most folks are not large enough to use them. LRP is scalable. I can buy LRP insurance on 10, 15, 20, 30 head of cattle. So it's the first thing we've had available for small operations, know it's out there. When I first started talking about LRP, the premium, the premium subsidy was about was 13%. And it got moved up last year, we got moved up early this year. But now the lowest premium subsidy at the highest coverage level is about 35%, and the lower coverage level is 55%. So just be aware it's much more attractive than it used to be because of that subsidy. So you may want to give it another look. Price risk continues to be something we've got to manage. And um, you know, if, if COVID taught us nothing, it, I think it taught us that there's some things that are just simply unpredictable that we're going to have to deal with in the cattle markets. Last thing I'll say, Patrick mentioned CARES. Um, if you've not done so, and you've got plenty of time, but you know, I, I would assume most everybody who's engaged enough to be on this call would, you know, would know this, but sign up for CFAP2 continues through December 11th, 2020. Be sure to take care of that. If you participate in CFAP1, you can also do CFAP2. It's a little bit simpler this time, 55 bucks a head on non-breeding stock. So, you know, thank, thank calves and feeders that you've got. Um, I, get, I got asked about bred heifers. Animals aren't considered breeding stock until they've calved. So if you've got bred heifers that have not calved or that have not calved at this point, then they would be eligible. Um, and if they had, then, you've, then those calves that they had would have been eligible in that time period. So, Past inventory, April 16 to August 31st, 55 bucks a head on non-breeding inventory. Sign up through FSA through December 11th, 2020. Again, I enjoyed being able to talk with you a little bit. I look forward to some discussion either now or later, and I always leave with my contact info. Feel free to reach out anytime. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Burdine. We appreciate that. Uh, real quick here, if you don't mind to uh, stop sharing your screen, uh, a couple quick questions though for uh, Kenny. One question we had come in was how useful can synchronization be uh, to a cow-calf herd and is that added cost and time worth it? Yeah, of course, Les Andrew does a lot of work with that and Ben as well. Um, I do like synchronization, you know, if it's, if it's necessary to get your herd backed up and on, on track. It's an expense, but you've got to look at it as part of your management system. And you know, you've got the synchronization benefits and you've also got the genetic improvement as well. I think you've got to value both of those. And, and yes, I think they're beneficial in a lot of cases. And it's one of those things too, you know, if you don't, if you do it and don't want to keep doing it, you know, just getting them synced and kind of on track, even if you go natural service later, you may get some dividends from that down the road. So, so yes, I, I, I do like synchronization in a lot of cases. All right, and then one more quick question for you, Dr. Burdine. Is there anything in the talks about a third phase for the livestock coronavirus program? Phase I don't know for certain. Um, that's kind of a political question, frankly, and things are, things are interesting in DC right now to say the least. So I'm not aware of anything in the works specifically right now, but, but there's certainly some ongoing talks about some relief bills. I don't know what will be in those, but I'm not aware of anything specific right now. All right. Uh, again, want to thank uh, all of our sponsors. Uh, you all probably seen those uh, floating across your screen here as we as we transition speakers here. But uh, definitely want to thank all those sponsors. Uh, and one more question I want to try to slip in here. We had uh, after Patrick spoke uh, on the first session, uh, but probably for both of you since it may be a little more regional markets. But any info or uh, insight on the grass fed or organic markets. And I'm gonna kind of open that up for both Dr. Burdine and Patrick. Y'all have anything to share on that? Sorry, I didn't prep anything on it, but both those markets have been growing 
and the other thing that I would say is that you know one of the one of the um, you know one of the one of the byproducts of COVID was increased interest in off farm purchasing. And I think both of those markets are poised pretty well to capitalize on that increased interest in off-farm purchasing. So the combination, I think, of that and just the fact that those markets fit pretty well. Yeah, they're small markets, they're niche, but folks, they're growing and don't discount them on a per head basis. They're, they're definitely out there and attractive. Yeah, and the, the only thing I would have to add to that, I would agree with um, with what Dr. Burdine says, especially coming out of um, you know coronavirus, it's provided some opportunities. And I think the biggest opportunity, you know, if you go the grass fed and organic route, is uh, you need to make sure to market it. You know, whether that's some kind of third party verification or you know if you're going you know straight to the consumer, um, I think it takes a little bit more marketing footwork um, on you. But I think there's a there's definitely a lot of opportunities there. <laughs> 